So what it's called is the sum uh, and the difference of uh, cubes. So what I'll do is I'll just write them both down and what I'll do is I'll, I'll prove them to you. I'll show you what they actually equal down below and why they work. And then over here we'll work a few quick problems to show you how to use them. So basically what it boils down to is if you have some term, call it A, and you cube it, and you have that term added to some term, call it B, and that one's also cubed, this is called the sum of two cubes. Now A can be anything. It can be a variable cubed, or it can be some expression cubed or whatever. B can also be anything. It can be a number, it could be an expression, it could be a variable cube. But any two uh, times you have two uh, guys like this added together that are cubed, it can always be written as follows. As A, whatever A is, plus B, these bases here, multiplied by this polynomial. A squared minus AB plus B squared. Now I'm going to show you why this works in just a minute, but for now let me just get them on the board uh, and then we can kind of like go off and, and talk about why they exactly work. But if you identify that something looks as if it fits into this form, or if you could uh, rearrange things and f force it to uh, legally, with the rules of algebra, write it in terms of this, then you can just write the answer straight away, this is the factored form. Similarly, if you have a cubed and you subtract off b cubed, so you have the difference of two cubes, then it looks like this. It's very similar as you might guess, a minus b, and then over here it's a squared um, plus a times b plus b squared. So you can see the differences between the two here. When you have a plus sign between the two cubes, this the first term here is plus, and then you have a minus sign in the trinomial. And then when this guy is minus here, then it it, it, it causes a minus sign in the first uh, binomial out here, but then this flips to a plus sign. So try to remember these, try to memorize them, but honestly, you don't use them that much, so it's kind of better, honestly, I just think you just know that they exist. If you ever need to solve an equation or do something with the difference of cubes, you could probably just look it up. It's not something I have memorized from when I was in you know, algebra a long time ago, but I do know that the sum and difference of cubes is something that is a, is a, is a nice uh, form that can be uh, factored in this way, so I know that it, uh, that it lives somewhere, and I can look it up if I need to. But for now, we're just going to put these on the board, and I want to spend a minute showing you why they work. Uh, let's just start with the, the tail end of here. We're saying that a cubed plus b cubed is equal to this. So what I want to do over here is I want to take and draw a little arrow here, and let's talk about the first one. What if we have a plus b multiplied by a squared minus ab plus b squared? And I wanted to ask you um, to multiply this out, right? How do you do it? You have a binomial times a trinomial. We've done this many times. You take the first term, a, distribute it into each of the terms. That'll give you three terms. Then you take the second term, b, and you also distribute it three times, which will give you three more terms. So you expect to see six terms, right? So let's go ahead and do that now. A times a cubed, or a squared, is going to give you a cubed, and then a times negative ab will be negative a squared b, you add those exponents on the a. a times b squared is ab squared. Okay, that's the first three terms. So we're done with this, we move to this one. b times a squared is a squared b. I can write it as b a squared, but I'm going to flip it around to a squared b so it'll match this one here. And then b times negative ab will be negative ab squared, and then b times b cubed is going to be, I'm sorry, b squared will be b cubed. So one, two, three, four, five, six terms, but notice what's going on. Uh, this term here exactly adds up with this one because this is a negative and this is a positive, so we actually get a zero when we add those up. And then this term here exactly adds with this one, also giving you zero as well, a b squared, negative a b squared. So the only term that actually survives here is the very beginning term and the very end term, which as you might expect is exactly what we were trying to show. So we, here we know that a uh, cubed minus, I'm sorry, plus b cubed. So what we proved is that if we take the right hand side of this guy, multiply it all out, cancel it all out, what we get is this. So the, we've proved it by going backwards, but essentially you can think of it this way. Anytime you see something like this, you can, um, you can automatically know that it's the sum of two cubes, or if you see two things that are cubed and added together, you know that you can write it in its factored form like this. Remember, the factored form 
is basically looking at an expression and trying to figure out what two things can be multiplied together to give you that. So if you ever see something like this in a problem, you can write its factor form because you know that it's always going to look like this. We've gone through and showed the cancellation. And just for kicks and to give us a little bit of practice with this additional, let's take a look at the second one. And we're saying that this guy is going to multiply to give us this. So we have a minus b times a squared plus ab uh, plus b squared. Now it's the same sort of thing. Let's multiply it out. What we have is a times a is a cubed again. a times ab is going to give us a squared b. a times uh, b is, or sorry, b squared is going to be b, a b squared. Now this is a negative b here. When you multiply by the a squared, you get uh, not a plus sign, you actually get a negative uh, a squared b because you're multiplying a negative times a positive. Now this times this guy gives you also a negative, but it's a b squared. You add those exponents on the b's. And then this times this is also a negative. b times b squared gives you a negative b cubed. So then we go and look at exactly the same thing. We say, well, we have this guy here, a b squared matches this term, but it's negative and positive, so they cancel. And then the a b squared goes over here and cancels with this one because it's a positive and a negative, so this gives you zero. So the only thing that's actually left in the entire thing is a cubed, everything's gone, but I do have a minus sign, b cubed. All right, so we've shown that when we take the right-hand sides of these guys, we multiply them all out and we can we can show ourselves that the left-hand side must equal the right-hand side. That's why I'm doing it. Most books will just write this down and say, just use it. But I don't want you to think that these things come from nowhere. Now you might say, well, how did they know that it was like this? How did they just make this up? Well, it didn't make it up. They, people, a lot of people who, who worked on math over, over the years, over the last few hundred years, have looked at special cases of equations and make it their life's work to figure out what they could set it equal to. How could they manipulate it and make it simpler or make it useful? And so someone a long time ago sat down and figured out that this was the correct form and they probably did it by backwards multiplying and showing that you can get the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side. Now what we're gonna do is use these to factor things. We know a cubed plus b cubed is equal to this factored form, so let's take a look at a practical problem and see how we would actually use it. Let's say I gave you a problem on a test that looked like this, t cubed minus 27, and I say factor this expression. The very first thing you're gonna do is try to figure out what is common to both of these terms. What can I pull out? Well, I have a t cubed, I don't have any t's here, I just have the number invisible one here and there's 27, I can't pull anything else there. So then you say, well, I'm, I'm done, I can't really factor anything out, but then, the next thing you do is you start looking at special cases. You notice right away you have a cube, and this 27 should start ringing bells. Remember I told you when we did a difference of two squares and, and the perfect square trinomials, I said certain numbers should kind of get your alarm bells ringing, your, your, your sense, your spider sense, if you want to call it that, right? You should start thinking about things. When you see numbers like 4, that's 2 squared. When you see numbers like 9, that's 3 squared. 16, 25, 36, you can keep going. Those are the perfect squares, right? So that you need to also start thinking about what cubes would be. And this is one of those things that comes with practice, right? So 27 actually is a special number because you can write that uh, as what? As 3 cubed, right? And that's something that you may not realize until you do this stuff a lot, but w why is that the case? Because 3 cubed is 3 times 3 times 3. The first two uh, threes pr multiply and give us 9, but 9 times 3 is 27. So 27 is called a perfect cube, just like, just like you know, 16 is a perfect square. 4 times 4 is 16. 27 is one of these perfect cubes. So you're going to run into some of these perfect numbers uh, as you go on th in, in through math. And we'll do a few, we'll, in the next problem I'll show you another perfect cube, but probably one of the most important ones, of the, of the low numbers anyway, is 27 being 3 cubed. So when you write it like this, it's obvious, it's the difference of 2 cubes, and we have a rule for that. Anytime you have something cubed minus something cubed, you can always write it like this. A in this case is just t, the first variable, and b in this case is going to be the number 3. So basically in this example here, uh, a is going to be equal to t, and b is e going to equal to 3. So we can write the answer straight away. It's going to be, um, well, I'll just write it down what, as is written over there. It's a minus b, and then it's a squared plus ab plus b squared. 
right? But we now know that A is T and B is three, so we just stick it in there. So what we have is T minus three, and then we have T squared plus AB, which means T times three. So let's write it as three T uh, plus B squared, uh, the, the last one squared here. And then the last step, we'll just simplify a little bit. T minus three, T squared plus three T plus nine. Let me double check my math here. T minus the, uh, three, T squared plus three T plus nine. That's the final answer. How did we know that was the final answer? It's because the problem was given to us as a special case, right? Up till now, we've only been factoring these, these binomials and things as special cases. Are they perfect squares, right? When you have the number 16, you know it's a perfect square. Four times four, it's a beautiful number. 25 is a perfect square. Five times five. 27 is a perfect cube. Three times three times three, meaning three cubed. And some of these binomials are just, they're, they're the difference of two cubes or the, the difference of cubes. And when we have a difference of cubes, we know that a very special factored form is always true. So we just figure out what the things are and we stick it in there. We don't have to do any more work. We could multiply all this out. And when we do, we would get this. I'll leave that to you. We kind of already did it on the other board. So we don't, I don't feel the need to do it again. But um, that's how you would use it in an actual problem. So let's take a look at another problem. Let's say you have eight times P cubed plus one. And I told you, I want you to factor this. The first thing you do is you say, well, what's common to both? And you don't see anything because there are no P's here, no numbers that seem to can come out. But this P cubed should be a, a clue to you. You should at least start thinking about cubes, right? But it doesn't look like it's anything special here because of number one. But then you realize, well, wait a minute, number one can be written as one cubed, right? I mean, when you think about it, the number one cubed is just one times one times one, which is just equal to one. So this number one can be written as one cubed, right? So you might say, all right, it could be written as eight P cubed plus one cubed. And then you look at this and say, well, this is pretty close, but it's not quite the, 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 the sum of two cubes. I mean, this is a cube, this is a cube, but what about this eight up here? Well, just like I said with the 27, you need to have your, 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 your little awareness go off. 27 is a perfect cube, three cubed, three times three times three, that's 27. You're gonna end up learning, needing to know that. It turns out that the number eight is one of those special numbers that you'll just learn over time. It's also a perfect cube. When you think about it, the number eight can be written as two cubed. Why? Because that would be two times two times two, and you all know two times two is four. Four times two is eight. So eight is actually a perfect cube. So because it's a perfect cube, I can write it like this. Wrap it in parentheses, two times P quantity cubed plus one cubed. And now it's very clearly the sum of two cubes. The quantity A up here in our little rule is what's inside of here, 2P, that's what's being cubed. The quantity B in our little rule up here is just the number one, that's being cubed. Why does this work? Because this exponent applies to the two making eight and that uh, applies to the P separately, you kind of distribute the exponent in, giving you eight P cubed. So you can go over here and remind yourself that when you have the sum of two cubes, it's just the sum of A plus B and then A squared minus AB plus B squared, right? So then you can apply that straight away. So what it's gonna be is uh, A cubed plus B cubed. This will help you me memorize them a little bit over time as well. So let's just write it down. Uh, A plus B and then A squared minus AB plus B squared, where A and B are given uh, just like this. So then we will just substitute in what we know. A is this, so inside of here it'll be 2P plus B, but just, just number one. And then over here we have A squared. So you gotta be careful though, because when we say A squared, it's the quantity 2P, the whole entire thing is what's actually squared. Because the, the value of the, the quantity that's cubed here, the base for lack of a better word is 2P, that's what's being squared. So write it like this for now. And then minus A times B, 2P times one, 2P times one, that's A times B. And then plus B squared, B is, is one. So I'm just gonna write it as one squared. Now in the next step, we'll just simplify it a little bit further. 2P plus one. What is 2P squared? The exponent is gonna apply to the two giving four and then it'll also apply to the P giving me four P squared minus 2P times one is just two P plus the number one here. Let me double check my answer. 
2p plus 1, 4p squared minus 2p plus 1, that's the final answer. So it all becomes a game, basically, when you're trying to factor these things. First, trying to pull out what you think might be common, but in these cases, nothing is common. You can't pull anything out, so you look for special cases. You might not immediately see if it's the sum of two cubes or the difference of two cubes, but you can use the rules of algebra to write it as the sum of two cubes and the difference of two cubes. If this number in the problem, for instance, instead of eight, if it was seven, then I would never be able to do this problem because it only works that I can write this thing as 2p cubed. But if this were seven, I would not be able to do that. I would not, because seven's not a perfect cube, right? Or if this number over here, instead of 8p cubed plus one, what if it was 8p cubed plus two? That wouldn't work. It wouldn't be the, the sum of two cubes because I would not be able to write this as a cube at, the, at the, uh, the last part of it here. So you see what I'm trying to drill in over and over again is that these are all very special cases. In the next few lessons, we'll be factoring things that are not special cases. We'll take the training wheels off and, and, and let you go and do things that aren't just special cases. But for now, we're just doing things that are very specially constructed to be one of these special cases here. So what if we have x to the sixth power plus y to the third power? And I say, hey, factor this. First thing you do is say, well, what's common to both? Well, here's a bunch of x's, here's a bunch of y's, I can't pull anything out. You do see a y cubed, and that makes you think maybe it is the sum of two cubes, but this is obviously not cubed. So you look at it and you say, well, it's not the sum of two cubes, I have no idea what to do. But then you need to start thinking. That cube here is probably not an accident. They're probably trying to get me to use the sum of two cubes. So I need to use the rules of algebra to write it in terms of sum, the sum of two cubes. Is there any way that I can write this legally to make the first term a cube as well? And the answer is yes, why? If I write it as x squared, but also raised to the third power up here, and then write it like this, then it is the sum of two cubes. And why is this legal? Because when I have a power raised to a power, we've done this before, you just multiply the exponents. Three times two is six. So x to the sixth power is, or can be written as x squared to the third power. So then I have a cube term added to a cube term. So then I can use what I've already used over there. But now I know that a, in our little uh, formula there is just x squared, and b is whatever is cubed over here, which is y. And if you remember, for the sum of two cubes, when it had x cubed plus y cubed, um, then what I had was, it was a plus b, and then it was a squared minus a b plus b squared. That's what happens when you have the sum of two cubes. So then you can just go and plug in straight away. We now know that a, whatever it is here, <laughs> look here, I put x and y, I'm sorry about that, that's confusing. It's a cubed uh, plus b cubed, and this is what it would be equal to here. So now we know a is x squared, so I'm just gonna stick it in here and say, well, it's gonna be x squared plus whatever b is, and then over here, it'll be, be careful, a is x squared, but that's also squared. So the best way to write it is x squared squared. Whatever the a is, which happens to be x squared, is what is raised again to the second power. Minus a times b, which is x squared times y, uh, plus, again, b squared, but b is y, so we'll make it y squared. Now in the final step, we'll just do a little simplification, x squared plus y. Here, x squared squared, you multiply the exponents, giving x to the fourth power minus x squared times y plus y squared. And this should be the final answer, let me double check, x squared plus y, x to the fourth minus x squared y plus y squared. So that is a good introduction to the sum of cubes and the difference of cubes. Again, they're special cases. What you should do is try to see if you can identify cases when you can write an expression as the sum of two cubes or the difference of two cubes. And if you can, then we have some handy uh, some handy uh, relations that have already been worked out that we've shown are true, that if I can write them like this, then the factored form will be this and so on. Now what we'll do in the next lesson is we'll just work a few more problems, slightly higher complexity, but the same idea will hold. We're gonna try to manipulate expressions into sum or difference of cubes and then write their factored form. And then after that, we'll take the training wheels off and teach you how to factor expressions that do not fall into one of these special cases that we've discussed so far. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.